Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. It takes a technicolo- technological wizard to... It's your youth that enables you to figure that out. Because you're like three, four months younger than I am. So, <clears throat> inshallah, uh, God willing, today we'll hear from Srimad Bhagavatam and discuss Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, uh, Chapter 7, Text 42. And I see that we still have Victor engaged. Sukhaya Dhukamokshaya Sankalpa Eha Karmina Sadapno Sadapno Tihaya Dhukam Anihaya Sukhavrita Sukhaya dukha mokshaya Sankalpa eha karminaha Sadapno tihaya dukham Anihaya sukhavrita Sukhaya dukha mokshaya Sankalpa iha karmina Sadap noti hayadu kam Anihaya sukhavrita Sukhaya dukha mokshaya Sankalpa iha karmina Sadap no ti hayadu kam Anihaya sukhavrita Others, please. Any Vaishnavis? And anyone from the World Wide Web? Apparently not. Okay, word to word. Sukhaya, for achieving happiness by a so-called higher standard of life. Dukamokshaya, for becoming free from misery. <clears throat> Sankalpa, the determination. Iha, in this world. Karmina, of the living entity trying for economic development. Sada, <coughs> always. Apnoti, achieves. Ihaya, 
I'm sorry, Ihaya by activity or ambition. Dukkham, only unhappiness. Anihaya, and from not desiring economic development. Sukha, by happiness. Avita, covered. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In this material world, every materialist desires to achieve happiness and diminish his distress, and therefore he acts accordingly. Actually, however, one is happy as long as one does not endeavor for happiness. As soon as one begins his activities for happiness, his conditions of distress begin. Responsively, please. In this material world, <clears throat> every materialist desires to achieve happiness and diminish his distress, and therefore he acts accordingly. However, actually, however, one is happy as long as one does not endeavor for happiness. And as soon as one begins his activities for happiness, his conditions of distress begin. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Every conditioned soul is bound by the laws of material nature as described in Bhagavad Gita. Prakriti kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha. Everyone has achieved a certain type of body given by material nature according to the instructions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Ishwara sarvabhutanam hridesya arjunatishtati Brahmayan sarvabhutani yantra rudhani Mayaya. The Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna, and is directing the wanderings of all living entities who are seated as on a machine made of the material energy. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Super Soul, is present in everyone's heart, and as the living entity desires, the Lord gives him facilities with which to work according to his um, ambitions in different grades of bodies. The body is just like an instrument by which the living entity moves according to false desires for happiness and thus suffers the pangs of birth, death, old age, and disease in different standards of life. Everyone begins his activities with some plan and ambition. But actually, from the beginning of one's plan to the end, one does not derive any happiness. On the contrary, as soon as one begins acting according to his plan, his life of distress immediately begins. Therefore, one should not be ambitious to dissipate the unhappy conditions of life, for one cannot do anything about them. Although one is acting according to false ambitions, he thinks he can improve his material conditions by his activities. The Vedas enjoin that one should not try to increase happiness, decrease distress, or decrease... The Vedas enjoin that one should not try to increase happiness or decrease distress, because uh, for this is futile. Tasyaya Vaheto Prayate Takovida. One should work for self realization, not for economic development, which is impossible to improve. Without endeavor, one can get the amount of happiness and distress for which he is destined, and one cannot change this. Therefore, it is better to use one's time for advancement 
in the spiritual life of Krishna consciousness. One should not waste his valuable life as a human being. It is better to utilize this life for developing Krishna consciousness without ambitions for so-called happiness. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militang Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukhaṃ karoti vācalaṁ paṅgaṁ laṅghāya tehegirīṁ yat kripā tamahaṁ bandhe śrī gurūṁ dīnatāranaṁ śrī caitanya mano bhishtaṁ sthapitaṁ yena bhūtale svāyaṁ rūpakadāma yaṁ dadāti svapadāntikaṁ nama om viṣṇu pādāya krishna preṣṭāya bhūtale śrī mate bhakti vedānta svāmane tināmane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Panchakalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhubhya Eva Chapatitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Sukhaya Dhukha Mokshaya Sankalpa Iha Karminaha Sadap no ti haya dhukam ani haya ani haya sukhavrta. In this material world, every materialist desires to achieve happiness and diminishes distress, and therefore he acts accordingly. Actually, however, one is happy as long as one does not endeavor for happiness. As soon as one begins his activities for happiness, his conditions of distress begin. So this sounds a bit fatalistic. It sounds like no matter what you do, uh, you won't be able to get ahead, uh, and that things are already determined. So why bother? And in a very real sense, in an essential sense, that's actually the case. It seems like we might be able to, to do that, right? Um, the other day in Laguna Beach, Vaisheshika Prabhu was um, outlining our endeavors for material happiness. You work like crazy through school to get as many A's as you can and avoid the B's even, right? I mean, even the B sometimes was a problem when you, when you came home, home with your report card. Nowadays, I don't know. What do they do? Do they email it to the parents or something? I don't know. Um, but we used to have to bring our report card home. We used to have it have to have it signed by our parents and bring it back to the homeroom teacher. Well, homeroom teacher in junior high and high school to our teacher in elementary school to prove that we showed our parents and they saw the grades and they saw the comments from Mrs. Herbs, my sixth grade teacher, who had also been my fourth, our fourth grade teacher. The whole class, we kind of moved through the last three years of elementary school together, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, pretty much, it's the whole class. Mrs. Herbs, when we were in the fourth grade, she was maybe 23, 24 years old from Minnesota, just moved to California, and, um, and she had this group uh, of kids that included a, a bunch of boys whose greatest ambition was to become juvenile delinquents. This is, this is the group I fell in with when we moved from my little uh, central coast town of Lompoc to the San Fernando Valley. Um, and then she got married, took a year off from teaching, came back to teach the sixth grade, not the fourth grade. She decided, well, she'll try sixth grade and see if she doesn't get, doesn't uh, uh, fare better. Well, she had the same crew. <laughs> she was, re well, she must have gasped when she saw the roster, Richard Wells, Jimmy Ackerman, Bill Reed. Oh, Lord, here we go again. So um, she was ready with us with a whole disciplinary thing that included writing sentences when, for each infraction that we got 10 demerits for. When I became a writing teacher and I saw how students were injured by writing, I, want, I thought I would love to go back and find Lois Herbs 
and, and just give her what for, for using writing as a punishment. Because I had all these traumatized students over the years in college. So you get those, you, you get those A's and, and you take the course for the SAT because now they have courses for the SAT. Back then we just kind of like, we took the PSAT so we'd have some idea what it was about. Um, and then we'd take the SAT and just see how the chips fell. And then hope we did better again in our senior year. Um, so you get your 1600 on your SAT, your perfect score, right, on the SAT. And you get into Harvard. And then you get into Harvard Business School, or you get into uh, a PhD program at MIT or Caltech in, IT, you know, information technology or whatever. And, uh, but each, you know, each thing we think we've accomplished, oh, I got the A's, I got the 1600 on the SAT. Now you have to be a freshman at Harvard. And it's not always easy, and it's not always fun. You think you're hot stuff when you were, you know, at Mount Vernon High School. And you get to Harvard University, and you realize, oh my gosh, this is a whole different pool of people. And then you get into the PA, and, and so you have to struggle. You have to deal with all the different kinds of peer pressure that distract you. And you have to really steer that straight and narrow course to get that summa cum laude degree from Harvard. So you can get into Harvard Law or MIT or whatever, wherever it is you think you're going to get that. Have I talked about the poster at KB Books here? When I taught at San Diego State, um, we've got an app here in San Diego. A lot of cities probably, this, it's pretty much the same. Here in San Diego, you've got an on-campus official bookstore and then you've got the off-campus, unofficial bookstore where you might get better prices. And in San Diego, it's KB Books. Uh, at San Diego State, Mesa College, uh, maybe Miramar, I can't remember. But uh, So <clears throat> I remember one semester, probably at the end of a semester, I was, I, I had I'd been to the Aztec Books on-campus bookstore, and I went to KB Books, which is right next to the campus. Um, to check on the orders for my students for the next semester. And there's this big poster on the wall in KB Books. And at the top of the poster was this like this big McMansion kind of thing. Just big, garish, ugly, huge house. And down below it, in front of it, was this huge garage, like six bays. And in each bay was a, 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 a car cost more than the house that we bought on the Big Island. Um, and below that was the caption on the poster, justification for higher education. Now, with my liberal arts degrees, with my English degrees, there was a whole thing about this on the Prairie Home Companion, Professional Organization of English Majors, P-O-E-M, which is, you know, you get your English degree and uh, you know, I, you know, I, mean, I know of one person very close to me whose uh, double major in English and geography qualified her for a part-time job as a barista, and this is someone who had never, she'd smelled coffee at grandma and grandpa's house, but had never drunk coffee. But fortunately, it's just a formula. You just, you know, you just fill it. Part-time job as a barista, and, 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 and another part-time job as a produce manager at a at a food co-op. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm standing there in line to, waiting to talk to somebody about my st a book order for the next semester and I'm looking at this poster and I'm thinking, just take me out back and shoot me, please. So, get, so finally, you struggle to get through Harvard. You want to impress all those huge name professors that you see on, on TV all the time because they're like top drawer experts in whatever their department is. And, uh, and then you get into Harvard Law. And then you get a job at some, oh, maybe you get, uh, uh, maybe you get a clerkship with some uh, a federal judge or, or maybe even a Supreme Court justice. 
and then you get a job at some white sh at every level it's a hassle i mean if you get into graduate school basically you're some professor's gopher and you're chasing down one of their projects at least for the first couple of years of graduate school until you figure out what you you know what your contribution to the uh the the um uh uh, a discipline is going to be because the PhD dissertation needs to be original, needs to contribute something new to that discipline. 300 page book. And then, um, or, or if it, you know, you go to Harvard Law, then you, uh, you, know, you become, a, you know, you're, the, you're the, the kid who gets the coffee for the judge and you have to write the opinion. You have to do all the legal research, you have to do all the scut work um, for, for the judge or the justice or whatever. Uh, and then you get a job at a white shoe uh, law firm in, in New York City or Chicago or L.A. or something like that. Um, but you're an associate and, you know, you're you know, you're you got all the junk cases for a long time and you have to struggle and play all kinds of politics and everything to eventually become a partner. And, and but along the way, something's always bound to happen. Something's always going to happen. And even if you do it, even if you score it, it's like I, when I was thinking of being a lawyer, I thought eventually I'll have a, a nice big house overlooking the Potomac River. Uh, I lived in the Washington, D.C. area overlooking the Potomac River and my life will be gravy. It's a struggle every single day. If you're a partner, that means you've got to worry about the, the way, you know, the finances in the law firm, because that's your income. You're not necessarily working on so many cases, putting in so many billable hours, but you've got all the little associates and, 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 and the junior partners doing all, all the work. And you got to worry about the anyway. It's just and then guess what? You get sick. Or you get old or maybe you just die. Or even better, maybe, maybe you're really pious, and as you're doing all this, you're doing all sorts of pious activities that even get you to Svarga. Sounds pretty cool, right? I mean, whole. Oh, your life is practically eternal, and the pleasures there are stuff that we can't even imagine. Chine punni Then you have to come back down. When your credit runs out, then you have to come back down. You have to get back down to earth, literally. Back to this Murtyaloka, this place where death is the prominent feature. Um, so what is all that about? We struggle and struggle and struggle to get ahead in this world. And even if we actually appear to succeed, it, it's all gone. In a moment, I'll tell you, in a moment. When Dravid and I are close to 30, and we'll tell you, we don't know where all those years went. Um, <laughs> oh, that's right. It's the three on both sides, isn't it? I missed that. Oh, gosh. Yeah, my, my degrees were in, in English, so I have an excuse for not being able to do arithmetic. Um, I always celebrate, when, like if I'm using paying with cash, I always celebrate if I got it right. <laughs> so, well, oh, wow, my, my degrees were in English and I still gave you the right amount of money? Um, ultimately, in, in the pers from the perspective of the Bhagavatam, it's really all for naught. It's just, it's a futile endeavor. Because, and Srila Prabhupada uses, the, the verse uses the word happiness. A and we see, somewhere in here, we see false values. False value, well, the Sanskrit word for false value is anartha. We're chasing anarthas. We're chasing false values. And we see at the beginning, Arjuna is making material calculations at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. And you see, this isn't going to make me happy. He's confronting, you know, he asks a, a Krishna to pull his, his chariot up in between the armies so that he can get a sense of 
what this is about, what he's about to undertake, and where does Arjuna, uh, where does Krishna pull Arjuna's chariot? <laughs> right in front of Dronacharya and Grandfather Bhishma. His like deepest attachments in this in the world. And he he just takes one look and he sees all the others, cousins and buddies and former allies who just found themselves on the wrong side because of political considerations. And he just says, can't do it. Not going to do it. And, and, and so Krishna has to school him. He has to show him the difference between, you know, real artha, real value, uh, the real value of human life uh, and these false values, all these attachments. Because it's not so much that he has to slay um, his, you know, he has to slay his uh, great uncle, uh, practically his grandfather. He served as a grandfather for both for both families, for both sides, right? Um, or his his own uh, martial guru. But it's the attachment that he has to deal with, and he just can't deal with this. And Krishna and and he gives a very dharmic sounding argument in support of his desistance. And Krishna says, yeah, sounds good superficially, but eh, let's think about this more carefully. And so over 600 odd verses, he takes him through it and has him look at the situation from different angles of vision. And then he ultimately says, forget it all. Sarvatarman parityajya mamekam sharanam bracha. Forget all these different ideas of dharma and just take shelter of me. And even if there's a sin incurred by doing so, because that's, uh, that's how Arjuna opened up, it's sinful for me to do this. Killing my grandfather, my teacher, my cousins, my buddies. This is six, you know, and then just think of the social chaos that's going to ensue. All these ladies without husbands, and kids without fathers and sisters without brothers. I mean, the whole economy is going to be shot all to heck. This is, and, and even if I, even if I do win, what do I really gain? Because I've created all this chaos. How could I be, how could I possibly be happy? And Krishna says, it's not about you. Right? This is not about you. Ultimately, he says, just love me, and here's how. Forget all this other stuff. Just take shelter of me. And I hate to beat this drum. No, I don't. I love to beat this drum. This is, <clears throat> this is what Jiva Goswami refers to in the Paramatma Sandarbha as Stuna Nikanana Nyaya, the logic of pounding a post. Because Srila Prabhupada brought this verse up. <clears throat> he uh, doesn't give a citation, but he quotes the first pada of this verse from the first canto, fifth chapter of the first canto. Tasyaivaheto prayateto kopita. That we need to work, we, if we're going to endeavor, we should make an endeavor for something that's really valuable, that human life is really meant for that actually distinguishes human beings from other animals. Because all the arrangements that we make, the big house with the big garage full of the fancy cars and all the big fancy parties that we do and the conferences that we attend and the awards that we put on the wall of our office or whatever, it's all just dressed up versions of what the animals do. Uh, I listened to some one podcast, an old podcast, I think it was Radio Lab, and, and there was like this kind of goofy um, episode about what's the uh, smartest animal in the world. And one guy was going to pre present uh, as the smartest animal in the world, a koala. But then he said, it turns out koalas aren't so smart. I mean, they spend 18 hours a day sleeping. And, and the six hours they're awake, it's all about eating and mating. And then he said, well, wait a minute. Maybe they're smarter than human beings, because look at what we do. 
You know, we get up in the morning, you know, and, you know, we check our email and all these things that we do during the day that just cause us to stress. And all that stuff is just a fancy arrangement. So we can eat nicely and have sex. And I was, I was, you know, I remember listening to this and thinking, that's a really interesting analysis of what humans like. That's the Bhagavatam's analysis of what human life's about. It's a fancy arrangement for koala life. And the koalas, all they do, they sleep, they eat, and they have sex. They don't have to go out and, and earn money. There's plenty of eucalyptus trees growing in Australia. All, even, even when the fires come through and, and wipe them out, other koalas, they still, they still have plenty of other eucalyptus trees in another forest. Or they can move to the Big Island, the Hamakua coast of the Big Island, where some brilliant politician had this idea of planting a f whole coastline full of eucalyptus trees where there used to be sugar f uh, fields um, so that there would be some like wood chipping industry f with Japan or something like that. Some corrupt politician. Anyway, it's really just a fancy arrangement for the same thing. So that kind of brings us back to one of my favorite places. This is these chapters, these three chapters in the first canto, four, five, and six, where Narada Muni, uh, Srila Vyasadeva falls into depression because he's done all this work compiling the Vedas. Vyasa literally in Sanskrit means arranger or compiler. So he's organized all this knowledge for the upliftment of humans. And still, he feels there's a hole in his heart. There's something missing. And he's just, he can't deal with it. And he says, you know, I mean, he's thinking to himself, well, okay, so what did I, oh. I mean, did I miss an exclusive emphasis on Krishna Bhakti somehow? And right at, you know, at the end of the fourth chapter, Narada Muni shows up to save the day. Ta da ta da He comes right, you know, and riding in with his vena, swooping in, I guess, with his vena. And he said, uh, yeah, here, here's what you've missed. And so he's giving um, in, in these, um, how did I, oh, shucks. I was looking somewhere else. This is such a wonderful part of the Bhagavatam, these three chapters. Um, okay, how did I get there? Okay, I know I've got a bookmark then. Okay, I'll do it this way then. I'm learning to navigate these things better different strategies. So we have, you know, we have these three verses. The verse that uh, Srila Prabhupada cites here is uh, the 18th verse, but the, I, I just want to take one more look before, um, before I go back to the middle of my little uh, hut in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Okay, well, let's just let me back up and try that search again. Um, let's take a look at these three verses, because these, these verses are so um, powerful and, and so important, and they encapsulate the whole idea of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam begins, the second verse begins by telling us, you know, First of all, who's, who's the best audience? Dharma projita kaitavatra paramo nirmatsaranam satam. He says, after Krishna has told us, sarva dharman paritiaja, completely reject. Not just tyaja, but paritiaja, completely reject. All conventional senses of dharma. And just take shelter of me. Don't worry about all the complications here. Just surrender to me. I'll, co I'll take care of it. Then the Bhagavatam says in the past tense, Dharma Projita Kaitavatra Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. So for those whose hearts are completely pure, and how is it they're completely pure? Because they're not contaminated by envy. They're nirmatsaranam, completely uh, 
free from envy. Anasuya. I wanted to throw that in because Anasuya. Um, and uh, and how is it that they're that they're completely free of envy? Because they don't have a personal agenda. Dharma projita kaita. They've completely given up the cheating religion, the selfish senses of dharma. And what does that mean? Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami explains again in the 22nd chapter of Madhya Lila. Um, it means dharma artakama moksha vancha. All the things that we strive for in the material world, completely reject them. If you've completely rejected the pursuit of, of these things, your own virtue, the uh, material advancement you can gain through that virtuous behavior, the pleasure that you can get, that you can enjoy because of that uh, material progress. And then, once you've seen through the whole scam, that desire for freedom. My, why is it cheating? Because it's about me. It's about my virtue, my progress, my pleasure, my freedom, my liberation. Once you've completely abandoned any personal agenda, now we've got something to talk about. Now we can talk about bhakti. And we see, again, in the 11th canto, we were talking about that, I think, uh, earlier this month. No, it was last month now, isn't it? April Fool. Um, you know, we were talking about, you know, how in, in the 11th canto, one of the sages is telling King Nimi, you know, that all, the, all your attempts to enjoy in the material world are futile, in, including the, the, the attempt to gain liberation. Um, and then he says, tasmat gurum prapadyeta. Once you've figured that out, then you need a guru, right? So this, so here's, um, here's Srila Vyasadeva's instructions I mean, Srila Nar Narada Muni's instructions to Srila Vyasadeva. And, and this time, even though it's late, I'm, I'm getting out of here tomorrow, so you know, nobody can hassle me too much. Um, I'm going to read the Sanskrit, because these verses are just so cool. What verse are you starting? 115, 7, 18, 17, 18, and 19. Jaktvasudharmam charanambujam harer bhajanna pakvo tapatit tato yadi yatakvava badrama bhuda mushikim ko varta apto bhajatam svadharmata. One who has forsaken his material occupations to engage in the devotional service of the Lord may sometimes fall down while in an immature stage, yet there's no danger of his being unsuccessful. On the other hand, a non devotee, though fully engaged in occupational duties, does not gain anything. And then in 18, uh, Narda says, this is the verse that Prabhupada alludes to here in this, well, he cites, he does more than allude, he cites the, uh, quotes the first pada. Thus, yaivaheto prayate te kovido, nalabhyate yad ramatam upadhyada, talabhyate dukavad anyatasukam, kale nasarvaturgabhira, Ronghasa. Persons who are actually intelligent and philosophically inclined. Kovida means um, uh, learned, experienced, expert. So those who actually have some sense and are philosophically inclined should endeavor only for that purposeful end which is not obtainable even by wandering from the topmost planet down to the lowest planet. As far as happiness derived from sense enjoyment is concerned, it can be obtained automatically in the course of time, just as in the course of time we obtain miseries, even though we do not desire them. Who deliberately endeavors to suffer? Well, there are a few people, they have problems. They've been broken, sometimes maybe for over many lifetimes, um, masochistic people. But generally, our endeavor is, as today's verse says, to get as much pleasure as we can and avoid, as, uh, avoid suffering as much as we can. Um, you know, the behavioral psychologists, you know, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, they, they kind of, that was kind of the whole thing. I remember being in high school and they're talking about psychology and B.F. Skinner and his behavioral psychology thing. Um, 
Pavlovian kind of thing. Those were all, that was the rage back then. And, and then in the next verse, uh, Narada Muni kind of wraps this up. What he's doing, what Narada is doing here, is he's drawing a very stark contrast between bhakti and absolutely everything else. And I'll just, I'll wrap up with that in a minute. So then he says, Navaijanu jatu katanchana virjan mukunda sevyan vayadanga sangsritim. Smaran mukundanga dupa guhanam punar. Bihatu michen narasagraho janaha. He says, my dear Vyas, even though a devotee of Lord Krishna sometimes falls down, somehow or other, he certainly does not undergo material existence, even uh, like the others, the fruit of workers and so on. Because a person who has once relished the taste of the lotus feet of the Lord can do nothing but remember that ecstasy again and again. Such a person becomes literally haunted by rasa haunted by whatever pleasure they got from serving the Lord. And I'm not going to go there again. I'm not going to take you through those uh, tikas of, of Vishwanaths again. Um, you can go back and listen to my other classes or whatever, or you can just you know, get your Cheerios and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, but this is a post that I keep com coming back to pounding, um, especially in my heart. If I can, if I can get this nail set deeply in my heart, then it won't be able to be, no one be, will be able to pry it out. Uh, that is my um, hope, hoping against hope. That just as we see in, this, in, in, in verse 17, um, if we engage in our occupational duties perfectly, we still don't really gain anything. And what he's alluding to here includes Varnashram Dharma, which if you do it perfectly for a hundred lifetimes in a row, might get you a post as Brahma. But what do you have? You still got a temporary post. When Hiranyakashipu approached Brahma for immortality, Brahma says, well, I can't give you that because... I don't have any myself. You know, I'm clean, you know, clean out of that. That's not, not part of my toolkit here. So uh, ask for something I can give you. So, of course, here on Yukashipu thought he was very clever with his attempted workaround. But how did that work out for him? Um, so even if we do that perfectly, Still, there isn't anything really gained. But if, if bhakti is so powerful that even if we completely blow it, just as we see um, toward the end of the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, to the extent of out of bad habit or bad association or whether, whatever, not just falling away from our practice, but really doing something awful, the real thing that's going on is that we've made an attempt, a one-pointed attempt, to gain Krishna Bhakti. I'm going to tell this one story. That we, I had this dear God brother, um, Aniruddha Prabhu, from New York. Hmm? The original Aniruddha, the real Aniruddha. Um, and um, Aniruddha was an old New York devotee uh, came out to the West Coast, did some uh, some service to Srila Prabhupada, as you'll see as I, as I uh, recount this an anecdote, um, and had some difficulties along the way. He, he kept stumbling and falling away. And at uh, late 73, early 74, he came to Hawaii, he came to Honolulu. And he would come around the temple um, because the temple was being managed and the community, the, the society was, was being reestablished um, under the leadership of Sudama Maharaj at the time. And, uh, and they were old friends. And uh, so Aniruddha is coming to the temple all the time. And he was a bit of a character, but he, he loved Srila Prabhupada like nobody's business. And... Um, he would gripe sometimes about the kitchen standards, especially because he'd had some special training from Srila Prabhupada in, in, in kitchen standards. 
And he did it strictly out of love for Srila Prabhupada. He was a wonderful devotee. And my former wife and I would sometimes just like hang out with him when we were able to get away from our deity service and, and uh, go for a swim or something. We'd usually meet Aniruddha at Ala Moana Beach. So he was having this really hard time. But as soon as Srila Prabhupada came, he stopped coming to the temple. Prabhupada was there for, I don't know, a week and a half or something, maybe two weeks. And Aniruddha didn't come around at all. <clears throat> the day Srila Prabhupada left, um, uh, when we were sitting with him uh, in the lounge at the airport, um, Satsurup Maharaj was reading um, newspaper clippings about ISKCON from around the world. And all of a sudden Srila Prabhupada stopped and he looked up and he said, I hear Aniruddha is here in Hawaii, but he hasn't come to see us. And someone said, well, you know, he's not doing so well. He's probably just embarrassed, you know. And then someone said, well, actually, the, most of the devotees were outside on the sidewalk, outside the, the, um, the uh, lounge, uh, keeping the kirtan going. And someone said, well, actually, Aniruddha came here to see you off, but he's like hanging back in the crowd. Uh, and he's outside with the kirtan party. And Prabhupada said, oh, he may come inside. There is no difficulty. So someone went out to bring Aniruddha in. Aniruddha desisted. And they came back in and said, well, Prabhupada, he doesn't want to come inside. And Prabhupada said, you do not understand. He became very firm. You do not understand. He may come inside. There is no difficulty. So they went out and told Aniruddha, Prabhupada really wants you in. So Aniruddha came in wearing cut-off shorts. He had a, a, a stud in his left earlobe, which back then was a signal. And he in uh, you know, a couple, three inches of his curly, uh, curly hair. And he, offered, he approached Srila Prabhupada with his hands folded in pranams and offered his respect. And uh, Prabhupada made him, insisted that he sit down. We were all sitting on the floor. Prabhupada was sitting up on the, in the seats. We were all sitting on the floor. And uh, Prabhupada insisted uh, that Aniruddha sit next to him on the seats. Aniruddha was reluctant to do so. And so then he looked, you know, they made a, uh, or he, well, the first thing Prabhupada asked him, uh, before he even made him sit down, he says, so Aniruddha, how are you doing? This was Srila Prabhupada's first concern. How are you? How are you doing? And Aniruddha blushed and he said, actually, Prabhupada, not so great. And so then Prabhupada insisted that he sit, to, sit next to him. They had, um, they exchanged a couple of minutes of small talk. And then Srila Prabhupada looked at us and he said, in the beginning, uh, uh, he is the beginning of the Los Angeles temple. And it was like, okay, all this other stuff is there. Aniruddha is having some difficulty right now. But here's the essential thing. He's done some service for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. He's given some service to his spiritual master. That's the important thing. That's what's going to last. The other stuff, it's ephemeral. It's going to come and go. And it was just, it, it, you know, it, it, it struck me because I, I, I could kind of feel some of the devotees judging Aniruddha. Oh, you know, poor Aniruddha. We knew what Aniruddha was about. He was about Srila Prabhupada. He was in a rough patch. Um, and, and I was so happy, so gratified uh, you know, that Prabhupada said that, you know, just was like you read in Chaitanya Charitamrita that Raghunath Patta Goswami wouldn't hear any criticism of any Vaishnava, even when it was war apparently warranted, when, even when there did seem to be some fault. He didn't want to hear about it. He only wanted to hear about what service they had done for Krishna. And I just thought, our Srila Prabhupada is so wonderful. He sees, you know, he, he's showing, not only sees the essence, essential thing, he's showing, he's highlighting it for us. Um, and I was very gratified. I shared that story after Aniruddha passed away on some, one of those internet sites that was going at the time for devotees. And I was very gratified to hear from the devotees um, in Honolulu that Aniruddha had shared that story himself. In other words, he didn't miss it, which just made my heart so happy. So, the verse, today's verse, once more, uh, just the English. Mm -hmm. 
In this material world, every materialist desires to achieve happiness and diminish his distress, and therefore he acts accordingly. Actually, however, one is happy as long as one does not endeavor for happiness. As soon as one begins his activities for happiness, his conditions of distress begin. Comments? Yeah. Questions? Dravita Prabhu. I couldn't help thinking of the uh, passage when I think it was the first class you gave when you came here, where you quoted Bhaktiya Sandhya Bhaktiya, right? And it's like full circle now. Here's your last class. Because it's the same theme. It's the Prabhuda. Is the is the is the uh, Prabhuda? Yeah, again, yeah, and he's and he has the same exact. Uh, I, I marked it here. Let me, let me if I could just refer to it in a second. Um, yeah, eleven three eighteen, and he starts out because you know I I was curious because I knew that verse Tasmat Gurun Prabhadeva did Geshu Shreya Uttamam, and it begins with the with the word therefore. Yeah. I said, well, what come before that? Because there's some argument here, you know? So he's giving the same argument that, that uh, you, you, uh, is, is in, is Pallad is giving. Pallad is giving to us. Yeah, yeah. And it go, so it, accepting the roles of male and female in human society, the conditions, so this is his first verse. They unite in sexual relationships, thus they constantly make material endeavors to eliminate their unhappiness and unlimitedly increase their pleasure. But one should see that they inevitably achieve exactly the opposite result. In other words, their happiness inevitably vanishes, and as they grow older, their material discomfort increases. All right. So what about? Uh, so then he just he he, he just uh, I don't know. I want to say rub, rubs it in, but he just emphasizes wealth because you need wealth. Wealth is a perpetual source of distress. It's most difficult to acquire, and it is virtual death for the soul. What satisfaction does one actually gain from this wealth? Similarly, how can one gain ultimate or permanent happiness from one's so-called home, children, relatives, and domestic animals? Or read cars, as you the different cars, which are all maintained by one's hard-earned money. And so now, let's. What about Svarga? Is this exact same? One cannot find permanent happiness even on the heavenly planets, which one can attain in the next life by ritualistic ceremonies. Even in the material heaven, the living entity is disturbed by rivalry with his equals. And how many times do we see the demigods and the demons fighting over the heavenly planets, right? And since one's residence in heaven is finished with the exhaustion of pious food of activities. The, uh, the denizens of heaven are afflicted by fear, anticipating the destruction of their heavenly life. Thus they resemble kings who, though enviously admired by ordinary citizens, are constantly harassed by enemy kings and who therefore never attain actual happiness. Therefore, any person who seriously advises ultimate good, Shreya Uttaman, must, ap must uh, approach a bona fide guru who is characterized by uh, being fixed in the shabda or the sound and being completely uh, detached from material affairs. And then he goes on to say how to serve the guru. But then he comes to this verse. And the reason I, I, I thought of it is because Pallad pre precedes this passage that he's saying here by describing its ecstatic symptoms. Remember that? There's a mm. whole series of, of how you can... Yeah, <laughs> you can have, yeah Ashtra Satya yeah. Kababa. Really and that's amazing. exactly... And then you come to this very famous verse, which Maharaj quoted when he first got here. And uh, let me just find this. This is... Yeah, so the one before it is so sweet too. Parasparanu katanam pavanam bhagavadisha mitoratir mitas tushtir nivritir mitaatmanaha. One should learn how to associate with the devotees of the Lord by gathering with them to chant the glories of the Lord. This process is most purifying. As devotees thus develop their loving friendship, they feel mutual happiness and satisfaction. And by thus encouraging one another, they are able to give up material sense gratification, which is the cause of all suffering. And this is the reason for the Hare Krishna movement, where Prabhupada's struggles so far to get a society and a temple where the devotees could associate. And then comes the verse that Maharaj quoted. This is, is full, full circle here. Smarantya smarantya mito gauga haram harim bhaktya sanjataya bhaktya bibrat yutpali kam tanum. The last one is about, uh, is, uh, last line is about uh, your hair standing it up. Standing it. The devotees of the Lord constantly discuss the glories of the, of the personality of God among themselves. Thus they constantly remember the Lord and remind one another of his qualities and pastimes. In this way, by their devotion to the principles of Bhakti Yoga, the devotees please the personality of God who takes away from them every, everything inauspicious. Being purified of all impediments, the devotees awaken to pure love of God, and thus even within this world, their spiritualized bodies exhibit symptoms of transcendental ecstasy, such as standing of the bodily hairs on it. 
So this is this is the choice. You go to Harvard, try to go, you know, get a degree, go to Wall Street, and make a lot of money and become miserable, or uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, or forget all that and work to become advanced in devotional service and experience eternal happiness. Just see how clever our glorious master, his divine grace, the Prabhupada, is that he's done this. He's a, I, 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 I thought I was going to get the morning off. <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and somehow or other, yeah, it was arranged like this. Um, this is the theme of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything else is, is a, a waste of time. You know, if it doesn't awake, even Varnashram Dharma, if it doesn't awaken a taste for this, for associating with devotees like this, uh, and and in in, in uh, experience these experiencing these ashta sattvika bhavas, these involuntary um, symptoms in our body as a result of that good association, if we don't get pakti in our hearts, everything else is shrama eva hi kevalam, nothing but a waste of time. Um, and along those lines, I, I, I want to express my gratitude, not just for myself, but I think especially for Bhakta Kaimi um, and, and for Bhakti Siara, for the devotees uh, welcoming, welping, welcoming them so warmly into the community, engaging them so um, sweetly. Um, and and I, I know that they're they're bringing, and devotees will be blown away by how they, I mean, they already love Kaimi and Sierra, um, but how they, they bring back the, the uh, happiness, the real happiness, that real sukha that they've enjoyed um, over the time that they've been here among you all. Um, the affection, the, you know, the, the trust that you've shown them and, and everything. Um, that they'll be bringing some of that back to Honolulu. And then when the devotees see them glowing even more brightly, um, it, it'll, it'll, it's, we're going to revolutionize this gone Hawaii all over again. Yes, Mataji. Hare Krishna, thank you so much for such a wonderful discourse and the knowledge you have uh, given us. Uh, my, uh, while uh, listening this, three to four questions are together, which might be blended, but I will just analyze and ask together. Uh, in one thing, uh, when in Swarga, you go even to a good karma and come back when there is not good karma. So after that, where we do go, uh, if you have a good karma, then second is, I know higher planetary positions might be there after Swarga. Then the question is blended. In this, when you explain regarding the, uh, you explain regarding the, like, Varna karma, occupational duties, uh, even though we perform 100% or in any age, in any time. It's not. I understand because the bhakti is not along with that, so it's not counted at all. So finally, the thing is that we have to be surrendered in the lotus feet of Lord. At the same time, when Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, he started the first word is dharma kshetre, kuru kshetre. Mm. So in, in any form, in any human beings, if you are discharging the duties, occupational duties very correctly, then in chapter karma yoga, again it is blended why it is not being counted. So I think everything comes when we are not giving ourselves or dedicated to a lotus feet of the Lord. But somewhere, somehow, whether those things are counted as a karma yoga or not, or when it will be counted, because certainly when sansaric life is there, or doesn't matter whether you are sannyasi in your life, but somewhere, somehow, you have types of duties are there which you need to discharge in any time, any form, or even we are animals, nothing matters. They also have to discharge their duties as well. So how it will be counted? And when? Ah, uh, well, oh. it's a testament to your intelligence that you were able to keep all those, <laughs> you know, keep all those together and then present them so nicely. Ultimately, 
there, it's not it's not that these things um, are inherently that that piety, even the piety that's presented in the Vedas, is inherently jugupsitam, detestable, disgusting. Um, it's not. It, it's actually good. It, it there is there is um, upward movement, um, and it's not that those literatures. That, that the Vedas, the Puranas, the Itihasas, Ramayana and Mahabharata, it's not that, that they're inherently places of pilgrimage for the crows. But compared to what's given in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's, they're a dump, right? Oh. And compared to what the Bhagavatam gives, which is not just apparent um, piety and, and, and apparent freedom, but actual love, real selfless love for Krishna, which he reciprocates um, unlimitedly. We give him a little bit of love, he gives us himself. Right? Just like a Dwaita Charya, we were, uh, last week we were celebrating, or over the last week, because we're in Southern California and we have Laguna and Long Beach as well. Over the last week we were celebrating uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance. And Advaita Acharya, uh, who himself is Mahavishnu, you know, part of him is, he's, he's like a, uh, an expression of Mahavishnu um, for the Kali Yuga, he was reasoning. Well, Krishna says in the Shastras that if someone worships him with love, even with just like some Tulsi Manjuris and Ganges water, yeah. he becomes purchased by that worship. He becomes, you know, as we might say nowadays, putty in that devotee's hands, uh -huh. you know. And so, so therefore, Advaita Acharya, with of course, he doesn't have just a little bhakti. He, he is like uh -huh. part of the source of bhakti. Um, but he worshipped with, you know, he showed us by example with the Ganges water and the Tulsi Manjuris and calling earnestly for the Lord. Now's the time. It's a mess now. It's a good time for you to come today. Got to come. And then later, Advaita Acharya released him by saying, okay, the marketplace is been flooded with rice there's no need no more need for you know rice merchants so you can go do your own thing now so um, that's so those things are good especially if they help us find the association of devotees who can share their bhakti with us so once so once we're able to come to the realization that all this other stuff is ultimately futile it, you know, I mean, it's good to be, it's nice to be good, you know. I mean, Fred Rogers was a really good person. This was a very sattvic person in a, in a very strange society. Yeah. But if he just, if he had somehow or other, he had been able to add a little bhakti to it, just think of the effect he could have had. He had an amazing effect on America, um, and still is, I think, nowadays through his foundation. But... Um, so goodness is good, okay. But it's uh -huh. that there's still some admixture of, of passion and ignorance that, uh, and and it uh -huh. makes it a dangerous place. We could we could slip and fall, but if there's bhakti, uh -huh. even if we slip and fall, there's no loss, as Krishna says at the you know in the second chapter of the Gita, Nehabi Kramanasasti. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Thank you. I understand. So the bottom is like, things should be selfless. And it should lead towards the path of the Lord, or should be dedicated to His lotus feet, and it should be very pious. Is that? What was it? Um, what were the three things that uh, Dravida said we should aspire for? Three qualities: nobility, liberal. We should be liberal, noble, and anybody remember the third one? Kind. Kind. Ah, okay. And. And the, the, the ultimate way to do that, the best way to do that, is to become a bhakta and share our bhakti with others. Then we, we not only become no, liberal, noble, and kind, but we become especially dear to the Lord. Dear to the Lord. Yeah. Right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. If I could just make one comment for, for her question. Before the hook comes? Y- yeah. No, Thank you. The, the, the first canto, second chapter, mm. verses uh, 7, oh, excuse me, 6 through 21. I'll answer your question about Varnashram and all of these different things. Yeah, yeah. Just one more time. First canto? First canto, second chapter, uh-huh. starting with verse 6, Sabai Pung Sang Paro Dharma. Uh-huh. And you could read through the. There's a whole lesson there to go to, through 21. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, and I it talks about Varnashram, what the, you know, and all, all the things that you said. Oh, okay. And Shama Hivi Kevalam. If you you do all your duties very nicely, but there's no Krishna there, it's, it's useless. Oh, okay. <laughs> but okay, it, but Varnashram is fine if it's for pleasing Sangsit here uh-huh. Haritoshana. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, and then, okay, thank and you. And Prabhupada wanted to establish Varnashram, not material Varnashram, but uh-huh. so Krishna yeah, being the same. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I'll take a look. At it. Thank you. Okay. Granta Raja Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Gaura Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Lancha kaupa tarubhya strikrapa sindhubhya eva chapatita.